Welcome to Cider Chat. On this episode, we're going to be talking about selecting the perfect cider for you to bring home. Going up, going up. Hello, my name is Rio Wincoller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. Which means that Cider Chat is essentially a gastronomic feast of both cider, pairing food, and voices from makers and enthusiasts and all the folks who are part of the apples and the picking and the processing and shipping. You know, we hit it on all eight cylinders. And if you drive big cars in America, you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) We got it going on. And this week, I'm really stoked because I've I've just finished a cider making series, a six part cider making series. So you might want to check that out if you are entering the fall right now in North America and thinking, wow, you know, people are talking about cider and how to make cider and I feel a little overwhelmed. Well, we made that pretty simple for you. So you could just go to the the catalog or what we call the archive of all the episodes before this episode, 243. And uh, that will that will definitely set you on your way. Uh, basically, 236 was how to make cider. And then we got into conversations with the folks at Stormalong Cider in my state of Massachusetts. That's where they're located. And they gave three rock solid episodes all about how to keep things safe and clean in your barn, your, you know, do-it-yourself cider making scene or at a commercial operation. And then I kind of took the helm back again and started looking at both the process of once you've made the cider, what do you do for the couple months in between before you bottle it? And then last week I talked about bottling cider. I could have said so much more last week, but I kind of hold myself back because I don't want to overwhelm. But one little tip that I did miss saying was, If you are kind of digging making cider, you definitely want to get yourself a bottling rack. And that's something that you could, once you're cleaning all the little bottles that you've been saving from your previous ciders that you bought, and you're thinking, oh, that's a beautiful bottle. I want to put my delicious nectar of the gods, which is what I consider cider to be, (laughs) into that bottle. You clean it out, and then you get these cool racks that you could tip your bottles upside down in and they're all ready to go. And then there's like a little thing that you put on the top of that bottling rack that you punch up and down with the bottle on it and it sprays a little bit of sanitizing solution in there one more time and then you could bottle away. So hopefully that's not too technical (laughs) to say right now, especially for new folks to Cider Chat. I'll put a link in the the show notes uh, and a little photo of what I'm talking about there. So just go to ciderchat.com and you can see what I'm talking about. (laughs) But I, I thought we'd leave the cider making piece a little bit to the side. And this is the stage of, you know, this is, boy, if there's any time of the year that you really are like apple on your mind, at least where I live, it's the fall. And I'm getting a lot of questions from people saying, you know, what you know, what kind of cider should I grab? I'm a little overwhelmed. I go into the store and I see all these cans, all these bottles, and I'm not really sure where to start. Well, if you're in that 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 situation, and frankly, I am too sometimes. I have some rock solid tips for you to begin that journey, and especially to begin that journey if you are just approaching cider for the first time and feeling super overwhelmed where you hear that cider could taste kind of like a candied apple to super, super dry. And you're not sure where you fit into that, or I should say, you're not sure where your palate fits into that. This episode is for you. So we're going to be talking about that, or I'll be talking about that with you. But first, we have a, a little bit of news out and about in Ciderville that we're going to get to next. First up is a letter in from the Netherlands updating us a bit about the situation there, considering there's a worldwide pandemic 
and the buildup of a new cidery that is being built by our friend and a patron of Cider Chat. His name is Marcel. So he writes, what a year so far. Thrown between keeping our business going and investing for this new cider journey. It is a party, but not one without some headaches. <laughs> I hear you, buddy. Uh, he continues with, as said, we grow and sell fresh herbs, mainly for restaurants use. No need to explain how that is going. Yeah, because everything's kind of closed. Uh, in spring, I had to cancel the cider equipment orders. Mm. However, finished building the cider house and kept on making cider in small batches. A lot of testing and tasting is done. Now, I just want to stop here because I, I know that this hardship is something that a lot of new startup cideries are doing, but there is always a silver lining in my mind on this. And that is that you really get to perfect where you're going and your pattern. I saw many cideries way before we were thinking there was going to be a pandemic or had that in our mind as a possibility where they were just jumping into making cider and then selling bottles of cider that wasn't really spot on. And that that kind of holds everybody back and certainly the the new cidery. So I think, you know, maybe that's one way to just look at the cup is half full. Uh, he continues, we figured out that some things are better built at home. For example, we built a bottle pasteurizer thanks to Nat West. And that's Nat of uh, Reverend Nats. He's based out in Portland, Oregon. Uh, thanks for Nat West for the advice. And he writes, would never have found this info if it was not for Cider Chat. Yay! <laughs> Saved a lot of money this way and kept on going. Like all the stories in your podcast, we made ciders from different apples. However, our Dutch eating apples provide some very nice ciders. We were blown away by the taste and some of the, quote, forgotten apple varieties, unquote, that are hard to get access to. We are talking about gardens, forests, and subsidized plantings. Holland has no cider apples, so we planted some, and that will take a while. This summer, however, we found some nice orchards in our province, Limburg. For those who don't know, probably most of the listeners, <laughs> Limburg is located in the very south of Holland and partially flanked by Belgium and Germany. It is the only part of Holland that has a mountain. Yes, there's one mountain in the Netherlands. Uh, that's why it's such a great place to go bicycling. Although I've been up in Arnhem where the national park is, and that's pretty hilly. Uh, so most mostly, especially that southern region of the Netherlands is flat, flat, flat. And that particular area of Limburg is, is really special. I've, I've been around there and it's spectacular. He continues with, so in our region, we found these old orchards filled with all the old local apple varieties, mostly named after small villages. It seems our region used to be a wine region, but Napoleon Bonaparte took all the grapevines away and gave every small village their own named varieties of apple trees. Hmm. In return, it turned out to be a beautiful region with hills filled with high fruit trees, one big mass of flowers in spring. Oh, I love that image. The apples, however, are of no commercial value anymore. Yet. <laughs> Agriculture in Holland is mainly of the high-tech type. Apples have to be flawless and all of the same size and only suitable for culinary purpose. The apples in these old orchards fall to the ground. Cows and sheep, sheep, cows and sheep eat them, or they rot away every year. Needless to say, these pure natural orchards make me very happy, and we have managed to get access to a few. About three thousand liters of juice is pressed out of them, and I was amazed by how much fruit is needed for a bit of juice. <laughs> That's true, since the orchards are not irrigated or helped in any way. At this moment, the juice is fermenting away, and I love that sound. <laughs> also, I am very pleased by the fact that we are still waiting for the permits for for selling our cider. People that tasted it and wanted to start buying it for the restaurants and shops are lining up. Great news in a country without any cider history. As said before, however, bad things happen. And however much the friggin' virus hits the brakes on everything, cider does not let go and leaves me all positive about the future. Cider up. 
Oh, man. Thank you, Marcel, for taking the time. His business is called, uh, I'm going to say it in Dutch, De Hennener. Uh, we would pronounce it like De Gardener, but the G is pronounced as an H. And he is, he's kind of cranking out, working really hard. I've seen some photos of the cidery when it was in process. And, uh, you know, this is yet another person. You, Marcel, are another person in the Netherlands that's going to just change the total concept of what cider can do and also the thirst for apples at a different level because the Dutch know how to do that high-tech gardening, no doubt. I mean, you go up to um, the just outside of Amsterdam, a little to the south. I'm losing the the name. It's near ooh, Den Haag, The Hague, where the, the tulips are. It's going to come back to me in a moment. Anyways, that scene is just fantastic for gardening. Even when you're flying into Amsterdam and you look out, you could see the tulip fields to the south. Uh, They know how to garden. And Marcel and all the makers in that beautiful country are going to be some the folks who we need to keep an eye on because they know how to do it right. So thanks for taking the time. Thanks for supporting Cider Chat. And do keep us posted. Best of luck. Now it's time to get into our feature topic, which is on selecting the perfect cider. And truthfully, this is for anyone who is new to cider in general. If you haven't really had a good experience with it, or you're stepping into a store for the first time, or you saw that cidery sign saying, stop by, open tasting room. This is a topic of conversation that I think you'll find very helpful. And even if you've been drinking cider for a long time, well, it's just some thoughts to think about in terms of moving forward, especially if you want to find more people to be able to enjoy cider with. These types of tips, I do believe, will help you find that selection and some of the things to consider when choosing the perfect cider for your table or picnic or gathering or just, you know, watching TV or a movie. So let's get into it. Walk into the orchards. I get this question quite a bit on which cider should I get, Rhea? Um, you know, somebody sends me a photo from their phone. They're in the store in real time and they're, they're like, have you had this one before? Do you recommend this one? Is this worth my time? Or I got a a text from somebody who is at a a tasting room at a cidery, and they're wondering what to select. So this is my advice. And whether you are a newbie to cider, or you've been in this for a long time, and you're going out and about, my number one recommendation for selecting cider is, without a doubt, find a cider that is made with 100% apples. <laughs> now that might sound ridiculous because you're thinking, well, what else can that cider be made with? And the truth is anything, tons of different things can be added to that base of fermented apple juice, such as fruit, spices, hops. I mean, cider is so welcoming. It, it brings everybody to the party. But if you are going to really delve into, well, the mastery of that cider maker and how well they could ferment a single varietal cider or a blend of cider apples, look for their 100% cider made with only apples. If you go into a store with all those different options on the shelves, Look for ciders made with 100% apples. Start honing your palate now to discover, for instance, what a a wine sap tastes like. Uh, And actually, it's awesome if you could find that apple and have a couple slices on a plate, taste a little bit of the apple, have a sip of the cider and compare notes and see what flavor profiles are matching and maybe where the cider has kind of moved that apple to another level, elevated it perhaps, or brought it down, that'll be up to you. It's your own personal preference. But to keep it really simple, look for cider that is just apple. I know that sounds ridiculous, but we have so many options. And, you know, I won't turn down a fruit cider, no doubt, Uh, meaning like a 
a cider with some blueberries thrown in. That could be really nice. A dry blueberry cider could be delightful. But by and large, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of apple varieties. And it's often surprising how a culinary apple like a Macintosh can be made into an exquisite cider. Who would who would have thought that? If it's not like a high tannic, you know, cider apple variety that a Macintosh could be so brilliant. So begin there. Seek out ciders that are 100% apple, because if you really hone your palate there, then you'll be able to see how makers are throwing in other, what I might call adjuncts into the cider to soup it up a bit and and have fun. Uh, so that's where I would begin. Don't, don't worry about anything else other than finding ciders that are 100% apple. And, you know, there's one other thing about looking for a cider that is only made with apples is that it will tell you exactly the skill level of the maker. Because if you can make a cider that is rock solid, has no faults, isn't tasting oxidized, it has good clarity, it gives you a nice mouth feel from beginning to the end, uh, you, you're you happy when you're drinking it, it's like thirst quenching, and you're not like, oh man, that's that's kind of falling short. That says a lot about the maker. Then I am like, I'm totally down with exploring their full range of ciders to see where they could take it. But I think it always, for me, begins with that baseline of just 100% apples in the cider. A <laughs> little side note, I do the same thing when I go to a craft brewery. When I walk in, I don't go for a West Coast IPA, which is really hopped up and or, or a chocolate stout or something you know, kind of exotic at the brewery. I never go there. I always start with like a, a Kolsch, which is a lager, uh, something like that kind of style, like a Budweiser style, you know, just, just a lager, straight up, easier, maybe a Hefeweizen because, well, that's one of my favorite styles of beer to drink. But I, I could tell at that very baseline level, whether or not that brewer can make a good, solid, not, no bells and whistles beer that's going to satisfy me. If they could do it at that level, then I will ex- explore the rest of their beers. And the same is true with a cider maker. So that's that's my little bottom line there. And I, I hope that will help you in that initial stage. You walk in, look for apples only, and go for something that's going to like really give you that nice experience whether it be in a bottle or a can. So you're in the store, you see a number of different ciders made with 100% apples, nothing else added. And you're headed to a family gathering or you're bringing something home for dinner. Now, the next question is, well, do you choose a dry cider? Do you choose a semi-sweet Do you choose a sweet? And how do you know if it's dry or semi-sweet or sweet? Well, if you are getting a cider from New York State, they've been working with a dry scale. And it's a horizontal bar. And it will show you where that particular can or bottle of cider that you have in hand is ranging there, whether it's super dry or really, really sweet. That's one way. So that's really nice in New York State. Uh, There is a photo on the show notes for this here episode, and there's even an episode on the dry scale in New York I'll refer you to if you go to show notes for episode 243 at ciderchat.com. But by and large, we are seeing most makers will state that on the label somewhere, let you know whether it's dry or semi-sweet. But what do you like? That's the main question. It doesn't really matter what they're making. It's really about your palate. So if you're new to this, I recommend get something that is dry, something that is semi-sweet and something that is sweet and discover yourself. You know, there's, it's all subjective. It's what you as a drinker prefer. Myself, I started off 
enjoying sweet ciders, and now I have a a full on love affair with dry cider. Nobody's business, and I noticed, and you will too, as you get in this more. But dry ciders, just the essence of the f- fruit when it's fully fermented dry, has this very interesting sweetness to it. And I'll just leave it like that. That'll be for another topic. But that that is a beautiful thing. And it's going to depend on, on the food that you're having too. If you're going to be serving food with it, which I highly recommend, uh, that will make your cider blossom in a beautiful way. And so you start honing your skills. So there are options, right? Dry, semi-sweet, or sweet. And then the other thing is, well, do you want a still cider? And when it says still cider, that means there's no bubbles, or there might be just very, very light bubbles. Or uh, typically canned cider is going to have a lot of bubbles in it because they're being force carbonated. And that lends itself to very big bubbles. A corked and caged bottle of cider is perhaps uh, using that champagne method. So you might have more delicate bubbles. It really, it really depends. You won't know at this point, by and large, we can't totally guarantee that a, a corked and cage is going to just be kind of that champagne method of cider. At least I can't, I can't definitively say that. So <laughs> without confusing you further, you look for 100% apples in that cider, nothing else. You're going to have to make a decision and look for some descriptor there. If they don't tell you if it's dry, sweet, or semi-sweet, and there might also be a descriptor such as sour, uh, which is not unusual. Uh, yeah, that could be a good choice too. But that's going to give you that that finish coming out on the end of the cider. And a, a certain kind of mouthfeel, like a dry cider, is really going to coat your mouth in a way that is kind of a little tacky. Like, But for me, I love that. It just kind of clears me up a bit and I'm just tasting the essence of the apple. The sweet could be more coyingly sweet, you know, (laughs) that's not the sound of it. Sorry. (laughs) People with their earbuds in going, what, what's she doing there? Uh, it, it just could be like, um, the mouthfeel after having not an ice cream cone, but a, a gummy or something like that. (laughs) I digress, don't I? Anyways, 100% apples, you want to check out whether it's dry, semi-sweet, or sweet, or sour. And next, we're going to go to another little tip when purchasing cider. If you could see the color of the cider, definitely take note. Cider, by and large, has a range from a straw-colored yellow to a deep amber. And then occasionally you'll see a red, red colored cider. And that might be because it's made with red fleshed apples, such as a red field. Uh, so find out, you know, is that cider looking red like a rosé because they added something like hibiscus in there to add that coloring and which will also uh, provide a little bit of flavor profile to it. Or is it because it is 100% apples made with red fleshed apples? So color is really important. If you see a cider in a bottle and it's looking purple, it must be a fruit cider, right? Which it could, you know, if you love that that color and, and that's what's really making you yearn to buy that cider, do it. Totally do it. Support cider makers. But by and large, you should know that there is a color and it goes from straw colored yellow to a deep amber or occasionally red. As we see more red fleshed apples being grown, we'll see more uh, ciders out there. And that's only really something that you're going to be able to see if you're in a tasting room where they're pouring cider already and you can see the colors there. Or if you could see the bottle, and it has to be a clear bottle. You're not going to be able to see the color in a green bottle. I'm sorry to tell you. All right. Next up, we're going to talk about whether to purchase cider in a bottle or a can. So you found your cider that's 100% made out of apples. 
you've decided that you're going to go for a semi-sweet cider and you still have a whole bunch of choices in front of you, some of which are bottles of cider and some of which are cans. Which do you choose? Oh my goodness, right? So, so many choices. Aren't we lucky? Well, you know, trying to true, if it's a special occasion, go with the bottle. With, without a doubt, go with the bottle. And if that semi-sweet or cider has a cork and cage, and what I mean by that, it has like a little mushroom cap cork on the top, and the cage is the wire that holds it on, well, you know pretty much or guaranteed that when you pop out that cork, it's going to release a nice pop, you know, just like a champagne pop that we are so used to hearing. That's celebratory. So if you're doing something that's celebratory, definitely go for the bottle. And of course, a lot of places only package their cider in bottles. So that even narrows it down. If you like a particular cider, support the cider maker. Don't worry about the packaging. The cans are great for traveling. Uh, cans recycle really easily. You know, they're kind of heavy going in on the hike and much lighter going out. Bottles are a little harder to pack that way. So those are some of the things that you're going to have to weigh in. But by and large, if you're at home, which all of us are doing right now because it's a worldwide pandemic, and you're coming up on a big dinner this weekend, or you have a date night that you plan, which is in-house, you're not going anywhere, you're going to be taking a picnic out to see the fall foliage. If you're somebody like myself who lives in New England, and we're packing a little, I don't know, medley of cheeses to go out for a drive and look at the fall colors, which are really, really starting to kick up, by the way, here. Uh, This is the first week of October, and it's looking nice outside, really nice, especially up north. I am going to bring both a nice format bottle for some fun, for that little pop, and then some cans too. So I do a little medley of both. You know, (laughs) when in doubt, get one of each. Well, now you can make your purchase and get out of the store and head home with your cider and start imbibing now. Well, wait wait till you get home, of course. Uh, next week's episode, I'm going to be talking about glassware to utilize with cider. And there's a range of options <laughs> besides, you know, the classic mason jar. But that's a good option, too. Don't forget that. <laughs> you could always grab a mason jar like I do. Have one right in front of me right now filled with water on my desk. So I'll be rolling out that episode for next week on episode 245. We're counting down to episode 250. I have a number of episodes with makers coming up. Uh, We're still waiting to roll out my conversation with Barry from Germany. So hang on to Barry. We'll be getting to you, no doubt. But I really want to be keeping it in the fall season right now, really encouraging you to select cider that fits your needs and explore this amazing world of apples and what it offers for all of us. I leave you there. This is Rhea Wincaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we do it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason why we drink it like this. Oh yes, there is. There is a reason. We like walking through the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. We like cider. We. We like We like orchards Having some fun There is a reason There is a reason why we do it like this Oh yes there is There is a reason why we do it like this Oh yes there is There is a reason why we drink it like this Oh yes there is There is a reason We like walking through the orchards Dancing in the streets Smelling all the blossoms Kicking up our feet Oh yeah, we 
we like cider. Oh yes we do. We like palm. Oh yes we do. We love orchards. Having some fun. There is a reason. There is a reason why we do it like this. There's a reason why we do it like this. There is a reason why we drink it like this. We like walking down the orchards, dancing in the streets, smelling all the blossoms, kicking up our feet. Oh, yeah. We like cider. We like palm. Oh, yes, we do. We like orchards, having some fun. Ha!